Buonasera, buonasera a tutti e benvenuti. È, è davvero un grande piacere per noi uh, avere stasera come ospite il dottor Ramadan Badri Hussein eh, che ci parlerà del eh, suo scavo presso le tombe di età saitica a, a Saccara. E adesso oh, cambio oh, dall'italiano all'inglese, eh, la, 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 la lezione sarà anche in inglese, eh, di modo di dare la possibilità anche al dottor Ramadan Badri Hussein di, di ehm, sentire e di comprendere eh, la, la breve presentazione che eh, voglio fare di lui. So, uh, it's a great honor uh, today to have um, dear colleague Dr. Ramadan Badri Hussein uh, with us uh to present his work in Saqqara. Uh, Dr. Hussein doesn't need uh, a presentation, just a few words to, to sketch his career. Uh, he's actually, uh, in my mind, a kind of uh, the perfect Egyptologist because he has both knowledge of working uh, and doing research at a high level at university and in the same time working in the field. He studied Egyptology at Cairo University between 1990 and 1994, and then he started off immediately working as an inspector of antiquities at Giza and Saqqara, where he worked for seven years. Uh, in this time, he had the chance to receive our archaeological training and to get to know uh, the cultural heritage and to apply new methodology in archaeology and in dedicated research, doing an excavation uh, for the ministry in Giza, Saqqara, and in Bahariya. He then went on to, uh, when he was admitted for the PhD program at uh, Brown University, and he, where he did his uh, doctoral uh, research focusing on Egy in ancient Egyptian language and religious text. Um, From uh, 2003 to 2006, he joined the excavation project of Brown University and Cairo University, the cemetery of Abu Bakr and Giza. And uh, uh, he returned to the Ministry of Antiquities in June 2009, uh, where he was put in charge of the Center of Documentation and Study of Egyptian Antiquities. He was also appointed as the Managing Director of the Publication Department And finally, the Chief of Staff to the Ministry of Antiquities in April 2011. At the moment, uh, uh, is uh, um, Director of the Saqqara Site Tombs Project and the Institute of Near East Studies at Tübingen University in Germany. We are very pleased that he accepted to be here today to deliver the lecture on the title The Archaeology of Mummification, a Syed Persian Mummification Complex at Saqqara. I had the immense luck last year to uh, visit, guided by him, uh, the site and to see uh, something which is very unique in Egyptian archaeology, to see this mummification workshop an embalming cachette and the communal burial shop that you will show to us uh, today. So uh, with great honor I and pleasure, I give the word to uh, Dr. Ramadan Badrin Hussein, thanking him for being with us today, even though virtually because of the pandemic. But as I said to you briefly before the starting of the lecture, this is only, uh, let's say, an appetizer, because then we will wait for you in Turin in, in present as soon as we can go back to normal way of living. So the word to you, Ramadan. Thank you, Thank you Kristen. Um, it's just an honor, even though it is um, a virtual lecture hosted by the Museo Kitsio, it's just a fantastic honor for me. Um, a very fine institution, um, one of the pillars of Egyptology outside of Egypt in Europe. So I am beyond um, happy and honored to be speaking um, to and hosted by this institution. Um, I want to uh, today just talk a little bit about our uh, work in Saqqara and give a new spin. Um, in the previous lectures, I was always uh, presenting our work and um, talking to people about what we've done in Saqqara. Today, I want to take it to a little bit of a different dimension 
and tied up to textual reference that we always know about mummification. So um, I have a lengthy presentation, but I would like to start with um, <clears throat> an anecdote, a very fine, nice story that I had when I was working in the Ministry of Antiquities at Giza um, Plateau. I was assistant to Dr. Zahi Hawass in, in that particular story happened, I think about 1999. It was during June, um, so pretty much um, very hot uh, summer in Egypt. And it all had to do with this beautiful image that you see here, um, a scene from uh, the tomb of Kar, and it shows here this uh, beautiful representation of the Ibu uh, structure, and what we know in Egyptology as the tent of purification. I'm not sure if we are really translating or understanding Ibu in that sense, but the story or this anecdote goes this way. So uh, Zahi wanted to do something about uh, the valley um, temples uh, in the Old Kingdom and uh, studying all the theories about the function of the valley temples and what was the purpose of these valley temples. And of course, one of them would be the valley temple of King Khafre. Uh, the building of the inspectorate, the Taftish, is <clears throat> right in the Western Cemetery at Giza, so to the west of the Great Pyramid. So to go down <clears throat> to the Valley Temple of Kafre, you have to walk really long distance and you go downhill and then uphill. So um, he wanted me to look at what Salim Hassan once thought to be an Ibu uh, pitched um, at the platform in front of the temple, the valley temple of King Kafre. So he told me, okay, Salim Hassan mentioned that there was an Ibu in front of this uh, valley temple of King Kafre. I want you to go down, look at the foundation, sketch it and come back to me. So uh, it was in the middle of the summer. I went down uh, walking on foot. Um, this is something about maybe uh, two kilometers. Um, going down and look for this foundation of the Ibu that Salim Hassan has mentioned. Um, I cannot recognize it. I can't find it. I go up again and I say, okay, I can't find it. I don't know where it is. I keep looking. Um, I did three round trips this way in the middle of the day. <laughs> it was hot. Then I hated everything about Ibu. And then um, my next assignment is to go to the tomb of Kar and look at the Ibu representation and uh, make a sketch of the representation and um, study it and then come back to him to discuss what the Ibu is about. So this beautiful representation has a story with me. So I know it very well since at least 1999 and I have even looked at it, um, that particular from this tomb, the, the wall, the Northern wall of Kar um, you see that the Ibu is represented two path, two ways like this, and which pretty much end up with entrances right here. And then comes in the middle, what looks like uh, this uh, ceiling that is made of reed mat, and then two rooms on both sides right here. This reed mat is covering a ramp because there's water right here. So that I was very familiar with. Then in the same wall, on the lower register, sorry, on the lower register in the corner, there is another representation of what we know as the Wabbit, um, also from the tomb of Kar. And interesting thing is that um, bent entrance right here, and then you go down with another bent entrance and you go to the inner room right here. So in the tomb of Kar, there is a representation of both the Wabit and the Ibu. The Wabit is in the lower register, the Ibu is in the upper register. Um, so which means possibly, we don't know what kind of activities happening where, we know the embalming would happen in the workshop, but what we know from this scene that there is um, a spatial disconnection between these two facilities. They're not near one another, they're not in the same place. And they're separated even in the scenes by register, one in the bottom and the other one on the uh, upper register. So this is a good distinction from the old kingdom of these two facilities. And also what would happen in the Ibu, we're not very clear exactly what kind of, what kind of purification 
uh, would happen in Ibu. From later on, after the Old Kingdom, we see that both the Wabit and the Ibu uh, became parts of the bigger uh, complex that is the Paranefer, with another uh, compartment, so another components of this Paranefer complex, if you want to call it this way. So we definitely have lots of textual reference about uh, the composition um, of the Paranefer and what are the architectural components of it. And of course, uh, Susanna Topfer had done so much about um, this particular textual reference and the Balsamiron ritual and what happens in both in the Paranefer itself. So I had these discussions even when I was at Brown University with Ed Brovarsky, um, who wrote about the Ibu as being the gates of heaven um, and the temple, the valley temples would be gates of heaven for the king. So this is all like a backstory for me about this mummification uh, complexes, but it never really was part of my research interest at all. Because when I went to Brown University, I was more focused on texts, religious texts in particular. So I was focused on coffin text, Book of the Dead, and also uh, pyramid text. And I made, I wrote my dissertation on the pyramid text copies of the Sayai period. Um, so especially in Memphis, um, Abu Sir, and Heliopolis. So I was very aware of the um, Sayai period um, tombs in Saqqara, all of them. And one of my dreams was to go back to these tombs after I finished my dissertation and start documenting the text and uh, produce an exact copies of these texts and do a more thorough um, textual studies, different approaches, uh, different philology from what we used to. So this is all was on my mind. And even when I went to Germany, I started working um, on these texts as a Humboldt fellow and also uh, started applying for the DFG. And I got a grant for six years to work on the Sayai tombs conservation, documentation, and publication. And our first phase um, of these tombs included all the tombs around the Pyramid of King Onus in the first phase and the second phase. The first phase, the first three years, were more focused on the tomb of Semtik, the tomb of Padinisit, and the tomb of Amun Taif Nacht. Um, Maspu uh, found five of these tombs between uh, November 1899 and um, I think January 9, uh, 1902. But Amuntayef Nacht was found by Zaki Saad, um, I think in 1948. So, but all of them have copies of the uh, permit text and also coffin text as well. So we started with Psemtik, Padiniset, and Amunte Nacht in the first phase. In the second phase, we are working on Padinit and Hekam South. So just to give some, some of you who don't know the uh, architectural design of the Sayat tombs in Saqqara and Abu Sir, those what we know them as the shaft tombs or what I call them the sarcophagus tombs. They're big, huge shafts, that's the main one. And in, um, every single cha main shaft has smaller shafts around, that's all the subsidiary ones. Um, and they lead down to an antechamber, and then um, you have a corridor that takes you to a burial chamber, single one, like this one with a vaulted ceiling, and this one is the uh, burial chamber of Padinisid. And the text on them, usually uh, copies of Perma texts and coffin, uh, coffin texts, sometimes you see um, some books of the other world would be there, some book of the dead, not much. But these, all what we know about the tombs that Maspero excavated in 1899 is just the reports from the Anal de Service, the first Anal de Service in 1900. And as you could see, this is the only documentation we had for them. And the text reproduction that was made by Maspero as well was the only uh, text copy that we had. So my job was pretty much to go do a second round of documentation of these uh, tombs. As you could see here, we used laser scanning and 3D technology um, in the documentation. And this is a top plan of uh, the burial chamber of uh, Tantec. And then here you could, we have two uh, combined laser scans uh, together. 
for the uh, Chamtec barrel chamber, Padilliza barrel chamber, and the connecting corridor. And even you could have these barrel chambers as a standalone model, the side shaft leading down to Padinese burial chamber. You could even take your 3D model into the AutoCAD and turn it into a 2D representation, not a 3D. And you can obtain your elevation right here in the matter of one day after you scan. And then you can have your inking like this on Illustrator as well. So since this is not the, uh, today we're not talking about how we do the uh, documentation, we're more focused on the, uh, the mummification complex, but this is how the burial chambers that um, mass crew excavated in 1899, Padinese, Samtik, Chani, Yibu, uh, those are the uh, 3D models in the connecting uh, corridor right here. Whatever behind is our new excavations. So we had also, you could, from these 3D, we made sure that we have two grids, one survey grid above ground and mimicking it underground 30 meters deep. So we wanted to know the relationship uh, between structures um, underground and above ground, as you could see right here. Also, we finished our conservation of these burial chambers, and this is Padinisit after we um, finished its conservation, the 3D model of all the walls and the text and um, the high resolution um, 3D model that we obtained, as you could see here for Padinisit, and we finished the line drawing now in, we are in the collation phase. This is pretty much the report as to the documentation of these burial chambers uh, that MassPro discovered. So we go above ground, we find the entire area covered with um, high mounds like this, about five meters high. And this was, this mound was extended to here on top of the main shaft of Padinisit. Um, I think Maspero, after he excavated these main shafts, he backfilled everything. And of course, a lot of debris is accumulated here, either during the time of Maspero or afterwards. But Pay attention to this mount because all the new discoveries were lying down right underneath this mount here. We started excavating the entire area, cleaning up. We wanted to pretty much focus on re-excavation of whatever Maspro has done to produce our map. But our project had its own self-dynamism. It just took us to wherever it wanted us to go. So we started working on um, surveying and we used 3D technology, laser scanning um, to do the survey and combining both laser scanning with photography together to get um, um, our survey map. What you see here, all these uh, yellow triangles are scanning stations. Those were would be scanning stations for the laser scan, the scanner and also they are um, survey points, which means they have their own, uh, their coordinates. And also they are survey or photography station for a 360 degrees. In this case, we obtain two layers of information, the geometry of the space uh, using laser scanner, and also the color information of the space using photography. And we can overlay these images together to get us we create the mesh by connecting all these scanning stations together. And then at the end, we get this image that is an exact image to what you see underground. This is not an aerial photograph. This is our uh, JPEG from a laser scanning uh, and a photography um, scanning. But the reason I brought this is that here is the main shaft of Padinisit that he uh, Maspro excavated in, eight, in, in January 1900. And then comes Samtik and Chani Hibu, the main shafts. The side shafts of the three tombs are right here on one line. And this is the chapel that Maspro excavated for um, the main shaft of Padinisit here. Maspro's, Maspro's excavations in January 1900 stopped right here. In March, in April, 2016, we only moved to the south about one meter to just make sure we have clear, um, we clearly identified the, uh, the, the chapel of Padinisit. 
but all of a sudden we found this shaft. So one meter, a little bit to the south of where Maspro stopped in 1900, in 2016, we found this shaft almost 17 years after him, uh, 117 years after him. So this shaft took, completely changed the direction of our, not changed, took our project into uh, another direction, forking off um, our efforts. So we look exactly what's down there. This is the shaft. We call it M23-2. This is according to our grid system. So it it's exactly looks like a small uh, Dynas 26 um, side shafts. That's why I thought it's gonna be leading us down to a new uh, Dynas 26 tombs like Padimisit or so. So, but all of a sudden we started to see that there are lots of deposits of pottery. Almost every 25 centimeters, there is a deposit of pottery. And then there's so much botanical remains we've collected from this, um, from every single layer with this pottery. Even some surprising deposits like this particular deposit, we found um, two contexts um, about, this was about something around five meters deep in the shaft. We found um, those about six to eight of these insects, they're cockroach-like, and they were found all the time with um, small pieces of red and white linen like this, and also uh, broken pottery like this, which means they were pretty much on purpose were put there. So those cockroaches like insects, we um, started looking at them and documented them. Of course, we kept them, we have them. So we're looking for an entomologist to uh, have a thorough um, study on them, but we have help to identify for uh, in the identification of them. So they belong to what I call the Thecarus niliticus um, um, uh, insects. So those were pretty much has been studied, uh, been considered as the uh, scorpion of the water because apparently they have a very painful uh, bite. Um, their venom is very capable of liquefying the internal of a human tissue or so. And I had to think about this particular uh, cockroaches, uh, insects, or the Lithocorus niliticus, the water bugs. They live in the water. Um, so this is not their natural habitat to be inside, deep in this shaft. So that one thing that gives an idea about they probably were put there on purpose for ritual reason. And in nature, uh, they're allowed, they are very able to attack something like a turtle like here, or even catch small fishes like here. So they're very vicious um, insects, water insects. And that's why they were called scorpion of water. And I've been looking at chapter 36 of the Book of the Dead and the vignettes of this chapter early on in the uh, New Kingdom and even the late period. In the New Kingdom, the vignettes of this chapter would so, which are deceased, uh, spearing a, what looks like a beetle in the New Kingdom. But in the later period, in the late period, especially we, by the end of Dynasty 26, um, all the way to the Ptolemaic Roman period, that beetle has changed into that particular cockroach insect like this, which is identical to our Lothicarus niloticus. So here I started to think about that this shaft has something to, else to do with whatever, not a tomb. So understanding Book of the Dead 36 and its vignette and tying it to this particular Lothicarus niloticus um, uh, insect, it has one of two things that I can think of. Either an apotropaic action, like what you see in the vignette of Book of the Dead 36, or, um, and also Book of the Dead 36, it talks about fighting uh, insects that feeds on the, mum on the mummy. And that's why you see the deceased spearing it. So that's the apotropaic act, um, a purpose of this particular context. 
but it could also have a protective um, uh, context in, in a different uh, dimension. Because this particular insect is also been understood to be the sacred insect of the goddess, the goddess Selkit. And the goddess Selkit is one of the goddess who are protecting the canoic box. So that also connects um, this particular insect into um, human body and mummification, mummies and mummification as well. So you could really understand this particular context in two ways, either the apotropaic aspect of it or an representation or a burial of a sacred insect that is the representation of the goddess Silkut. And that would reflect the treatment of these insects with linen and all this um, uh, potsherds around it. But to go down, keep down the shaft, going down this shaft, um, we went down the shaft, it ends up about 13 meters deep. And when it ended up here in the bottom, we go, we look up here, there is a corridor here. And this corridor is the Western end of this corridor and the Eastern end of the corridor starts here. And this is part of the underground galleries of the second dynasty. The second dynasty in Saqqara has three networks of underground galleries. One that starts a little bit to the north of the causeway of Unas, and it runs south toward the New Kingdom Cemetery. And that's why in New Kingdom uh, tombs, you see all these shafts cutting through the underground galleries of um, King uh, Ninecher, um, as has been identified through the work of the Hanover University in there. Then in our concession, runs the second uh, network. And the second network of these underground galleries, it starts exactly at the northern eastern corner of the Pyramid of King Unis. And it moves also south and it runs, bends and turns and twists. We are working on top of these parts of the second dynasty gallery. This shaft M23 cuts through the second dynasty, one of the second dynasty corridors, and it goes about four meters deep ends up with this large room, about nine meters by five meters. Then, but keep it, yeah, keep it, keep that in your mind, that particular gallery here, because it's gonna have a very interesting um, practical purpose for this big, huge room, nine meters by five meters. What, what is important in this room is that we found large deposits of pottery, those huge cash, of cups, bowls, uh, red fish bowls, um, uh, bottles from uh, Dynasty 26, amphorae, everything you would think of in terms of powder, even foreign imports, um, some braziers, we found two braziers in this pottery, plates. So a lot of pottery was found there. And with this pottery, this nice um, stones were thrown over this pottery uh, caches. And those stones have uh, mortar on almost all the sides, which means they've been dismantled from a structure and then thrown with this pottery. We as Egyptologists, we understand when you have large um, corpus of pottery in one place like this, especially those ones with embalming uh, material names written on them, we know that as embalmers cachet. So the embalmers, when they finish, um, the, the mummification, they collect all the vessels and everything they work to them, and then they bury it um, somewhere safe because now these vessels has been part of a sacred ritual that is mummification, then you need to keep it safe as well. But why do we have these stones dismantled from whatever structure they were part of and then thrown with these sacred objects that is the, um, the mummification uh, pottery here. We'll answer this very shortly. But to give you an idea about just a sample of these cups and the bowls and the, red, um, uh, the goldfish bowls that we found them, um, they have these labels. Some of them are very simple, like here, ut her s, um, embalming with it, or ut, and then it should be hiru, um, embalming in a day, 34. So the, whatever in this cup was used in day 34. And then here, 
Some would have Cephage and NTU together. From a philological point of view, the first thing you notice is that there is a mixer of hieratic or cursive hieroglyphic writing with demotic as well. Even here, demotic writing with cursive hieroglyphic here. This is a very interesting um, um, dating criteria because it's, it's, it is a clear chronological anchor here. Um, it shows that it is a proto-demotic time, which possibly middle of dynasty 26. So it, we're safe in terms of dating of this corpus, but there is a lot of stuff we're doing with ritual, uh, residual analysis with this thing. So the other part of this room that is very interesting is this large vessel here and the lidge that occupies the entire um, width of the eastern wall of this room. And to give you a better image, this is a very rough scan of this, um, only the eastern end of this room with this huge lidge here with a back drainage channel, excuse me, oops, with a back channel for drainage and it drops down right here. And then comes this vessel here. This vessel is, as you see here, it was put in the corner with a wall built around it. The very fact that it is in the corner with a wall built around it, it says that it was put there on purpose. There is a function for it but also gives an indication for a certain human activities happening 13 meter deep in this very large room. And on top of this uh, particular lidge right here with the drainage system. So I was thinking always about the function of this very large vessel. And one idea I had to look at is Dawson's idea about the use of the Sinu vessels, the big ones, as represented in the New Kingdom uh, tombs, that the deceased would be sitting, represented sitting on top of it like this and receiving a salt bath from who? From these two persons, the Ut, the embalmers right here. Dawson's idea is that the deceased is not really sitting on, he doesn't sit, the corpus is not sit, sitting on the vessel, it's inside the vessel and then having the salt bath. Either way, for me, there is a connection between this large vessels and a salt bath during mummification. Here it goes back to the key word of explaining the function of this room is mummification. But looking inside, that's a 3D model, uh, the photogrammetic model of this vessel with the wall around it. Looking inside um, this vessel, we found a very interesting thing something that refutes completely the idea that vessel should have, would have been used for a salt bath. So what we found is really very dark soil. It's sand like this, very, very dark with large amount of charcoals and even traces of burning in the inside. So that really does not speak of uh, using this particular vessel for salt bath during mummification but it, it, it was rather, a, as I was speaking to uh, Philip Stuckhammer here in Germany, he had an idea that the Egyptians probably have been using um, um, clean layer of sand in the bottom of their burning incense, um, 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 the burning sensors, and then they put a, a layer of animal fat, another layer of clean sand, and then the charcoal. So they have indirectly uh, burning the incense, not directly burning incense. So the indirect burning of the incense would guarantee that it would last longer, but the size of this particular vessel with all the evidence for burning uh, activities happening here would speak of an industrial um, size of burning incense in this place. So you have a room that is nine meter by five meter with a large incense burner right here that constantly um, producing the smoke of incense. And so in this place, you would imagine the human activities happening here 
with the drainage channel in the back, with this lich right here, with the source of fumigation right here. And this would be important if you need, you need incense for three reasons, if you have to do a mummification in this place, especially evisceration. So you were dealing with human cadaver. You have to get rid of the smell. So the incense will be a deodorizer for you. Then um, you have to get rid of insects and flies, and then the smoke of the incense will drive flies away. Then you would burn incense for its ritual purposes um, during the evisceration and mummification uh, process, especially if it takes many days, not just one day. So the, all the evidence in this room speaks of human activities that has to do with dealing with fluids and draining it, um, eviscerating human body, and making sure you have an environment that is the fighting um, insects, the deodorized, and also burning incense for ritual purposes. Um, and then you're missing one thing, that is the flow of air inside this place, 13 meters deep. And that would be through this interesting second dynasty galleries here. The all of a sudden has been appropriated in Dynasty 26, and their function was mainly uh, two folds, using those galleries for burial, and also using them as air shafts or the ventilation system for whoever inside this um, Wabit room, the evisceration room working 30 meters deep. So this is exactly the image from uh, M23, this shaft, leading us down, cutting through first the second dynasty galleries right here, and the air would run through them and makes the environment 13 meters deep here, very cool in the underground Wabit. And this was a big surprise for me to understand it this way because the old kingdom uh, representation of the Wabit did not show really whether it was above ground, underground, or this is a change of the um, layout of a Wabit um, later on after the old kingdom. So just to give you another idea that even the side shaft of Padinisit right here has cut through the same, excuse me, has cut through the same corridor that M23 leading down to the Wabit is cutting through. So even everybody from Dynasty 26 was appropriating these second dynasty galleries. And we'll talk about it later. So going above ground from M23, we started to look uh, for the structure from which we have these dismantled stones buried deep down in M23. And we were very lucky because more, a little bit over a meter to the south, we identified the corner of the structure we were looking for right here. Close the season because always nice surprises and happy ones comes um, the last week of the year season. So we closed it and the following season, um, we started working on that particular corner of the structure that we left the, uh, the uh, season the year before. And then all of a sudden we started within this um, corner, we started to have mud brick structures coming out. And that was one of uh, the mud brick structure that we were dealing with. It's uh, mud brick walls uh, surrounding a depression that's 65, meters, uh, 65 centimeters deep. And we started working on it. And all of a sudden, that corner became this big, huge line, um, uh, rectangular structure. This was the first mud brick structure we found. And within is this deep depression. And then comes this beautiful ramp, mud brick ramp right here. And then the traces of another um, mud brick structure right here, exactly identical to this one. We could see it on the ground, but this is on the ground level. It doesn't have its uh, uh, beaten earth floor, not, uh, does not have a depression. But I was looking, standing on top of this mound of debris, looking down at this layout and just smiling because this ramp in the middle and the two um, uh, rooms that is equal in measurements and everything, 
just reminded me with this interesting Ibu, and I'm gonna come uh, shortly to this. So in this particular room, one of the interesting things is that deposit of pottery we found here, right here. And Warda here is um, cleaning it, and we found this jar, and inside this jar was um, linen uh, cloth, that's completely impregnated with this um, black resinous substance, betumen, if you want to call it this way, but better to go with this black resinous substance for now. So it was completely um, soaked with this substance and put inside this particular jar. And of course we took it and we started um, putting it together and we could see it's completely, uh, it has so much um, res um, residue inside. And even on the outside of this jar, there are a lot of dripping of this um, black resinous substance, bitumen. The dripping alone says there is a heating process happening, which means that thing has to boil and it's uh, dripping on the outside of uh, the vessel. If there is a boiling process happening and heating process happening, we need a source of heat. And luckily, we found an M23 inside the Wabit, two of these three-legged braziers. This is one of them, and we ha I have it upside down. So this is, it, it's all falling together, right? All these pieces falling together right now to make a complete picture about the use of this particular structure. So, and then, as I said, I was just standing on top of this mound, looking at this layout and the ramp and the two rooms right here and smiling because this reminds me of that Ibu that I had been uh, looking in, uh, uh, for in front of the Temple of Kafre and also looking at the walls of the car all these years. So when we cleaned up this structure, it gave us exactly that rectangular structure right here the northern section of it is completely dominated, its layout dominated by this ramp and the two side rooms. One of them has this depression and the other one on the ground uh, level right here. The preparation of uh, linen wrappings would be here by soaking them with bitumen. But in here, in this depression, I think it might be, it, it could be the best candidate for treating the body with salt in this depression right here, the natron salt. But the layout alone speaks of, um, of its strong similarities to the representation of the Ibu on the Old Kingdom uh, tombs. But this one is something new. So I started looking and comparing, this is from car with the ramp in the middle and the two rooms on the side and these two side entrances. Um, and then also in the tomb of Meraruka and this same bit, that's why uh, Ed Vosky says it's the doors of heaven. And then in the tomb of Idu, same exact, the ramp is the common dominator here. And also the ramp and the two rooms in the side. So this is for me an Ibu-like structure. And even it's very clear in the tomb of Papian Kemen Meir, where you see that ramp in the middle, and the two rooms with the two side entrances. Um, this, our Ibu-like structure, is very, um, very similar to the representation of Ubu um, in the Old Kingdom tombs. But, and it's very close to be identified as an embalming facility, unlike um, the other structures that have been identified and uh, designi designated as possible embalming structures or facilities. The one in Nassif that was discovered by the Austrian uh, mission in Nassif and Manfred Bittak wrote about that being possibly a house of embalming. Its layout does not match the representation of Ibu or anything. Um, then the other candidate for a house of embalming comes from Doche that was discovered by the French. And this is how it looks like. So these two are not really close or similar to uh, the Old Kingdom uh, representation of an Ibu structure, for example. So there is a lot to be said about um, whether 
we can consider them or not, there is so much explanation needed to be done um, to verify them as embalming facilities. But for our two embalming facilities so far, the Wabit underground right here and the Ibu-like structure above ground like here. The Ibu-like structure provides us with another, with another thing, this shaft here. It's, uh, we call it K24, uh, according to our grid system. And it is about three meters by three meters and a half. And it goes down to 30 meters deep inside this Ibu-like structure. So spatially, it is connected to this particular complex. What does it look like? When we excavated it and started going down, this is a uh, laser scanning, uh, just a 2D of a 3D um, laser scanning looking um, south. And we see that there is six different tombs inside this shaft um, that is 30 meters deep. Tomb one, tomb two is very interesting because they access the second dynasty gallery. And this is the same gallery that you see coming from the Wabit all the way to this shaft right here. It bends and it turns until it comes to this K24 right here. This is what I call tomb two. And tomb three, tomb four, tomb five, and tomb six. And right here, there was a burial sec sequence in the middle of the shaft, not tombs. So very clearly, a very fast, I'll give you an idea about the content of every tomb here. Tomb one in the east, in the Western wall is plastered off and the plaster here is still in place. We had a, um, a case over it. So to protect it, we did not open this tomb. It's still there, but the, uh, higher, the demotic text about it it seems like it's a disagreement between a wife and her mother-in-law over the burial of the deceased um, son slash husband in there. So this for me, the familial dispute aside, for me, it, the first thing that gives me an idea about this is a place, uh, a burial there would be by arrangement and somebody could agree or disagree. The uh, tomb two, the one that I was talking to you, it's appropriating the second dynasty galleries and using them for burial. Um, there, it was completely covered, that entrance, and we have traces of the mortar over it. But we went down and looked. We did not play much in there. We left everything uh, as it was, because this is our next uh, project here. Tomb three is at the depth of nine meter. But this is very interesting because it has a hallway and uh, niches in the back for burial and on the side as well. A sing niches, and this one had a single burial, this had multiple burials, and the other ones had multiple burials as well. But in the middle, in the hallway, there is mummies, um, rows of mummies on top of one another. If you think about this particular um, burials here, so far, we had a single burial, that's in tomb one. We had multiple burials in tomb two. And in tomb three here, we had multiple burials, burials with coffins, mummies with coffins, mummy, mummies without coffins, mummies with sarcophagi. So we get three different kinds of mummies right here. And this is important. Then across from tomb three, exactly on the south wall, there is on also nine meter deep, there is a very a cut right here, a localist here, with the remains of two mummies inside this place. And we go down about 16 to 17 meter deep inside the shaft itself, we'll find this burial sequence, rows of mummies on top of one another, like this. And even those ones, you had mummies without coffin and mummies with coffin and even a child burial that is squished in the corner right here because of lack of space. And why do, you have, why do you have to be buried in this shaft if there is no space? Apparently this need, space is important in this place. And also the place must have some sacred um, attachment to it. It's been uh, conceptualized as sacred place. That's why people would be willing to be buried in there. 
about nine, about one, about 21 meter deep in the south wall, we found tomb five right here. And tomb five was completely blocked off like this, the entrance with this blockage uh, and the names of the two owners right here. So it's two people inside. They had, this one had a coffin and this one did not have a coffin. So it looks like a private comp uh, comp um, compartment for a, an uncle and a nephew, according to our text. But I'm going down to tomb six. Tomb six is in the northern wall, 30 meters deep, with a marking on the wall that shows a mummy from a profile right here. So pretty much tells us whatever we're going to see here. And this is how we started pretty much doing our laser scanning here of the situation of this big to uh, tomb six right here. We have two hallways. The laser scanner with the photography we had shows us that the situation when we found them, debris in the two hallways and accumulation of the debris on the side walls right here, vessel, large vessels and everything um, uh, lying on the floor, some fallen blocks right here, right here. and um, some tombs, some burial chambers with blockage. And our laser scan, the final one of version of it, shows us the early excavation of Maspro in 1899, right here with the side shafts. Our new excavation, the Wabit, right here, this, the, very, the one underground gallery of the second dynasty running through um, uh, or these shafts cutting through it because it's earlier. And then K24 right here with some of its tombs. So we go down here, we have the two hallways and on the side, we have six burial chambers. We're gonna very quickly look at the content of these burial chambers and tie them to um, the industry of mummification. Here, this one in the second um, hallway belongs to Tadi Hor, a single burial with a large stone sarcophagus with this um, shawapti figurines in, within inside two wooden frames, um, canopic jars on the two sides, inside not canopic boxes, boxes but wooden frames, and another single jar in the back right here. So this is the standalone models of our uh, photogrammatic models of these um, canopic jars with the Shawapti figurines, and then um, the coffin of Tarihur. Across, we have a burial chamber of four people, two in stone sarcophagi, an anthropoid, and another one. This is Yiput, this is Chani meat, and two wooden coffins on the floor. And this is how the, prog the progression of our um, excavation of this burial chamber um, using laser scanning and photogrammetry for documentation during excavation, okay? And then um, this is interesting because Chanimit has been a priest or have been a priest of so many gods. Amun is one of them. Neuches, this is the new one that we all of a sudden found out that she has a cult uh, in Sakar and she is a serpent goddess. And I think in Sakar at this point, she is... Um, a lioness-headed serpent goddess, which puts her in the same um, equal footing with Sekhmet. And I believe she is a form of Sekhmet in Sakar. Um, this is the new thing that I'm working on right now. So um, Yiput is also a priest of Ammon and Nuches. And I think this person as well is also a priest of Ammon and Nuches. So the first time we have reference to this goddess in our um, uh, complex, and the first thing that really puts these people together, tie them together, the, the, the only relationship that we have so far from the text that they are priests, priests of the same goddess, Nuches and Ammon as well. So we go to this room, burial chamber right here. We find that there is a long, um, about five burials in there, four here and the large stone sarcophagus right here. The stone sarcophagus belongs to a person by the name Dimit Yawit, and on top of it has three mummies and a fourth right here. So multiple burials 
um, and a single burial, this is also a good indication for whatever we're going to talk about later in terms of mummification and running a mummification place. So interesting one is this one in the middle, right here. Because of this thing on the face of this mummy is this gilded silver mask. It's first since 1938, uh, 39. Um, the 1939 mask was discovered by uh, uh, Sami Gabra in Tunal Gabal for Angkor. Um, and the one before it, it was in 1902, it was discovered by Borzenti for Ujahur. So this is uh, interesting, very rare. We're happy about it, um, but this is not the issue. So on the sarcophagus of um, Iyawit, that's the main burial, um, has this canopic jars with the Shawaptis, with his name, uh, Dinit Iyawit, or the short version of it as uh, on the Shawaptis, Iyawit. Very interesting thing is that connection between Iyawit and the person with the gilded silver mask. According to the fragments, um, the text on its fragmented coffin, um, a priestess, the second priestess of Mut and a priestess of Nuches. So another connection between Mut and Nuches. We found that first early connection between Mut and Nuches was in the bark station of the goddess Mut inside the temple of Luxor. It was built by Ramses II. But here we see another association from Dynasty 26 um, for this. And the owner of this um, coffin had this gilded silver mask. Her mother is a Maritneet. Iyawit's mother is a Maritneet as well. So it looks like we have a compartment, a burial chamber with two individuals at, uh, at least connected by uh, connect two, two individuals at least connected by blood, a brother and a sister right here. The rest of the members of this room could also be um, family members. But there is one line now connecting all these people deep down in this K24 shaft. Most of them priests and priestesses of Neuchius. So across from the burial chamber of Iawit, we have this one for Ta Didi Busted. Multiple coffins, about three coffins, and in the back is the burial of Ta Didi Busted right here. This is a photogrammetic model uh, and a laser scan um, model for the burial chamber of the situation of the burial chamber of Didi Busted when we discovered it with the canobic boxes here, but it ended up with the Shawapti figurines, but it ended up Didi Busted not having four, but having a set of six canobic jars right here. And we had CT scan these two, uh, that's her mummy. And we know that there is uh, human tissue inside it. Identification of this human tissue is not finished yet. We're still working on it, but this is not the issue. This is here a laser scanning um, combined together of the situation of every single burial chamber when we found it. Tadihur, Iyuput, Chanimit, Khonsu Irdes right here, Tadi busted with the rest of the group, uh, Iyawit with the priestess of the second of the um, uh, Mut and uh, Nuches. So as I said, interesting to see a single burial, multiple burials, because there's two here, and four burials here, five burials here, almost four burials here. And a class of people that definitely not um, low class or middle class, but an upper class um, uh, people here, since all of them possibly priests and possibly priests of Nuchias. And to give you an idea, again, that particular layout here of K24 with the multiple burials, can I compare it to something else? The only comparison that I could make, it's not very striking comparison, but similar. Dynasty 26, Giza Plateau, and what we what is known as uh, the shaft of Osiris. This uh, Dynasty 26 multiple levels of burials 
in the, in the first level here, you would see a hallway and burial chambers around, arranged around the hallway right here. And the second level of burials, similar situation, excuse me, similar situation of a whole central hallway and niches with large sarcophagi inside them. Uh, then comes the third level with what has been considered to be the symbolic burial of Osiris here, a, coffin, a sarcophagus in the middle and four pillars that is possibly an Osirian. So this is an interesting, what I take from this chap is the multiple levels of burials in there, the many tombs in a single place. Um, the symbolism of it can be discussed later. But also what I think about um, a striking parallel of the layout of K24 is the underground um, layout of the pyramid, uh, the step pyramid of Zoser especially the burial shaft right here, has been very central and a lot of underground, the network underground uh, corridors leading to it. And some of the images from uh, these underground galleries in the step pyramid right here, they just lead down to the main burial shaft of uh, King Zoser here. I think K24 with its layout here, it's more closer with even those second dynasty galleries leading to it. It's sort of an archaizing um, underground layout of a sacred burial right here. But if you go above ground and you look at um, the Ibu-like structure right here, it's pretty much, this is also a laser scan, uh, a photogrammetry, sorry. And what you see here is this, rectangular place with the Ibu-like layout in the northern section. And within this place is this shaft K24. Even there was a later burial cut in here, another later burial was here, and a third was here. And I bet you there is more here, but we did not want to excavate it here. So even when Burial within K24 has complete, all the space has been completely used. There is more that's been added inside. And when possibly the administration got very loose around this structure, there's more shafts cut around it and even small holes just abutting it for burials. That it looks to me like this structure has become like the necklace, the core, and then all those burials are gravitating toward it. Whoever was administering this place and running this place allowed those um, burials to come close. And where these shafts lead down to, they lead down to the second dynasty galleries, more of these second dynasty galleries. That's gonna be a network all leading down under to K24. So, if we look at textual references and nomenclatures that we see in papyri, Tematic papyri, and especially from Hawara, Memphis, and other places, Siut even, we have some names of places. And can we see this, the function of these names really and these nomenclature in our archaeological record in K24? This is K24 with the multiple burials. In a lot of the papyri talking about, demotic papyri in, uh, in particular, talking about a hoot that has been, um, that's been running by the embalmers um, and the cemetery administrators. And this hoot would be possibly a funerary mansion. And inside this mansion, this funerary mansion, the big tomb, there will be always mummies. And some of these mummies have coffins, some don't have coffins. So this situation we see here in K24 as a possibly a hoot. But there is another designation of a, a, a place within possibly the Pernefer um, that has been called the Ger Eho, as uh, Chapman has been noting it. And this place possibly has been considered either a mummy storage facility 
when the embalmers finish mummification, then they have to store um, the mummies in Agarahu, the mummies that is waiting the funeral. Then another, another explanation of the Agarahu could be a communal burial place. And K24 is definitely communal. There is so many mummies in there. Um, all told, 54 mummies came out of K24. So K24 within the Ibu-like structure would possibly function as the funerary mansion connected to the embalming workshop or the Gerehu being the communal burial place. Either one would work perfectly to designate um, K24 as a part of a mummification workshop. But if you look at the different types of tombs inside K24, we have also textual designation for them. And they make um, the all there is clearly um, uh, distinction. A single burial, according to Dumatic Pyramid, would be a we remit or a we uh, curse it. This is house of the mummy or a simple grave. But there is another designation that we had to, the resting place, the burial, that we had to possibly is more multiple burial place. And this is what we see in tomb two. In tomb three, there's multiple burials. And tomb four even had this airway image because it's a small um, localus with only two uh, burials in there. The tomb five had a multiple burials and it's a big one. Tomb six, definitely. So we see that our archeological record here in this K24 with its different types of burials inside it would have a match in the textual reference and we can identify them. So by the end, what we see here is a complex of three main structures. All of them had a very uh, distinct function yet they're all related. The spatially related and also functionally related. If we have a Wabit underground here, uh, through we go down through M23 to the Wabit underground with all the facilities that we've seen and the evidence for embalming happening underground. Then the Ibu like structure above ground here, and within it, we have something that is very distinct to our Saqqara complex that is. The K24 or the Hout 24 or the Rir Hu uh, 24 with all these interesting different types of burials. So if we have this um, complex of mummification uh, structures and ev textual evidence for their use and also archeological evidence for their use, we have to think about how this was been administered who organized the entire game in this complex. So in Saqqara, the cemetery itself uh, from Dramatic Papyri, we know that Saqqara at that time, late period dynasty 26 um, onward, we, Saqqara has been known that place is Tahasit in Inipu, the necropolis of Anubis. But there is an organization we can really sketch out from um, these papyri about who was running this place. There is always a Merchaset, the chief of the necropolis, but there also the Chetimu Netcher, that's the god sealers, and those are having the same job as a Rehab. And by this time, the Rehab is pretty much the embalmer, not just the lector priest, because those Chetimu Netcher, the responsibility, they were responsible for shrines and uh, the graves as well, and also they received a Shidi stipend um, in return for the service, the funeral service that they performed. And of course, the second class or the third class of people in this cemetery would be the most important of all of them are the Wahmu or the libation priests or the Kawakites, according to the Greek uh, matching term for them. And those were pretty much, there's so much um, evidence about the connection between the Ketimu nature in Memphis and the Wahmu, the Kawakites, in terms of dealing um, and, and, and the dealing with grave 
lots and graveyard purchasing and selling. And also the Kawakites in particular, their role in the, sem in the funeral service is being portrayed as those are the people who would pick up the, the body, deliver it to the embalming complex, the paranephra, and also purchase all the necessary sub, um, embalming substances, a, buying the uh, coffins and the graves, prepare the funeral. And of course, there is a stipend for it that they get. And also there is a siang, that is the endowment of the Kawakite. So running this complex with its administration as a business, um, and also providing services for the pe for the people. All this would also would lead us to talk about something uh, important. First time that we can have real life structures right here that we can connect to the two D uh, representation of the embalming facilities in the old kingdom that clearly were separated from one another spatially, but here they're spatially connected functionally connected uh, and also it adds a new component to this complex that is the communal barrier place right here and if we're talking about the um, administrators who were running this place and making a, a living out of it then we have to talk about a change of the pattern of burial in the late period starting dynasty 26 on you see that there is more focus on not just building a monumental tomb. So there is um, a change of uh, spending pattern here. You don't spend on monumental tomb, but you will be happy with a small place for burial and sharing it with individuals. And that would explain a lot about that flood of coffins that we um, uh, been hearing about uh, from Sakar in the last uh, few months, because every single um, Kawakite or Khutumu uh, nature would have to get access to part of the cemetery, purchase it according to all the contracts that we have, purchase it and use it for business and still the lots for people, coffins and uh, a great a space inside a graveyard inside this um, space that they have. And of course, they need to promote this uh, space that they just started their business in. So they need to be very close to sacred spots already. Um, they need to be close to landmarks like around the pyramid of King Unis or around inside the priest, in the precinct of the Bubastian, very close to the pyramid of King Zosar, or around the pyramid or in the precinct of King Titi, for example. Does that say anything about what could happen on the east mound here and the west mound here, close to this mummification complex? This is what I'm going to try to find out in the next uh, few seasons. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ramadan. That was just uh, amazing, even with the suspense in the hand at the end <laughs> with a new discovery that might come, but the discovery that you already had are quite uh, amazing. Um, I have myself um, a question uh, um, concerning uh, the, the, the uh, I mean, it's it just uh, fantastic what you presented concerning the Ibu uh, and Wabat and how K24 uh, can be the hoot mansion. Um, I, I have a question concerning what you call tom, uh, Tomb 2. Uh, which connects with the uh, channel that you also said, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the second dynasty galleries that you also said that they could be used as uh, air channel or for the Wabbit. Yeah. Uh, uh, does this imply, uh, or do you reckon that uh, the tomb 22 uh, was in use and sealed in a moment that the Wabbit was not in use anymore? Or do you see... Uh, uh, 
concerning chronology, uh, uh, does tomb 22, according to you, is it later or is contemporary? And a, a similar question for me is also concerning uh, the um, very tomb um, that you have at, at the bottom at uh, uh, K24. Uh, so you, you uh, showed very convincingly how uh, in K24 you, you, you can have a different layering uh, and different usage uh, of tomb from a hood, from a, uh, than a communal tomb to uh, 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 how we curse it or how we hat it. Uh, but in the planning, uh, I mean, whoever decided to build that mansion, funerary mansion, uh, did he plan to have a more uh, elitary uh, kind of tomb at, at the very bottom first, and then the hood came later on, uh, going on with uh, the use? And then I have a, also another question. I mean, I would... <laughs> have yeah, I will powers. answer the second <laughs> question. So um, first, um, exactly, this is what I think. The, the life use of this shaft starts from the bottom up. So um, the, of course, they needed um, to have everybody just occupy all the space here, sell out all the space with this prestigious burials, this very large sarcophagi and beautiful calcite uh, limestone, uh, calcite uh, canopic jars and everything. And then once this has been completely occupied, they go up, cut the first one, and but this has completely backfilled. So what, what is so interesting is in the filling of this shaft, going down all the time, we, have, we see that there is um, sand, clear sand, uh, this compact yellow sand. But here, in this uh, almost 17 meters deep, once we dealt with the sequence of burial in the middle here, the filling of the shaft completely changed. It became uh, about three meter of this very dark tufla that is very compact and three meter deep. And I was thinking, okay, the end of this shaft or what? But I was thinking where this tufla came from. And I do believe it came from, from the cutting of this tomb three and instead of taking the debris out of this shaft, uh, throwing it down here, K24, to make more space for the burial of the coffins that is in the middle right here. So the life use of this shaft starts from the bottom up. You, you occupy all the spaces bottom, and when you go up, you use more space. And I think the second dynasty gallery is here. We, we went inside and you see all these holes, the black holes. This is when the scanner did not go all the way up, but the black holes means there is a niche right here. And the niche here is all of them have blockage and the even human remains thrown on the, on the floor here in these uh, second dynasty galleries. So I think tomb two is part of the plan of this embalming workshop to access these galleries. And even as I said, outside here, those shafts, they still go down the second dynasty galleries. So this is, yes, I think in the plan, in the use life of this shaft, it starts from the bottom all the way up. And the second dynasty was planned to be accessed either from K24 or from these, all these shafts around it. The, um, the first question, I think that was it about uh, tomb two. Yeah. Yes. And also, what this, as I said in, in my uh, uh, talk about this particular gallery, that the side shaft of Padinisi cuts through it, then M23 leading down to the Wab, it cuts through it, K24 cuts through it because it bends and turns. It has been used for burial and also the ventilation system for um, the Wabit right here. You could, if you're standing there, you could feel really the air moving and running and goes down, cools down the space completely. Uh, I, I, I also had another uh, quick question. You said, of course, that you are working on that uh, concerning the cult of the goddess Nuches uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, a, in a Saqqara. Is there something else you could share with us? Yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, there is, yes. Um, uh, I hope I have that thing. I didn't, I took out this slide. Um, 
she first time she appears um she appeared okay um first time we know about nucius that in the bark station of Ramses II, um, inside the temple of Luxor. And even Ramses standing in front of, Mut, of the goddess Mut, and Mut in her um, uh, human form, and reciting the names of Mut when she turns into a serpent, when she assumes a serpent form. Um, he calls her, where it's Hakao, he calls her Isis, he calls her Renenuted, and then he calls her Nucius. And her name is written with the city sign and then the lake sign and then the S, then comes the um, cobra or the serpent um, determinative. So that's the first time we hear of this goddess as a representation of Mut when Mut assumes a serpent form. And even when it goes all the way to the Ptolemaic period, skipping Dynast 26, because there was no reference uh, until we excavated this, she also maintained that uh, position as being the epithet of the goddess Mut when Mut turns into a serpent. But from Saqqara, here we have um, the largest attestation, number of attestation for Mut, uh, for a new chest in a single space that this place. We have it here with um, Iput, we have it with Chanimit, we have it with the priestess that had the gilded silver mask. Um, I think we have it with this person as well. So we have it at least four times in this place. And all the time she is connected with Ammon and um, the art priests of Ammon and Nucius. But very interesting is the writing of her name on the sarcophagus of Chanimit here. He writes her name, Newt sign, the she sign, the S sign, and then comes um, have a lioness headed serpent. So if you go back to Mut, Mut has a human form. She has a serpent form and she also a feline. And interestingly is now Nucius is a feline and a serpent form of the goddess Mut. But in this case, this, it is the first time that we see a priesthood Connecting, uh, connected to Nucius. Every time she appears, she appears as an epithet of Mut with no priesthood, with no cult for her. The very fact that we have a class of priests for her down in the bottom of K24 speaks about a cult for her, possibly a chapel for her somewhere, uh, maybe in Saqqara, maybe in Memphis, but also the very fact that the priests of Nucius and the priestesses very uh, they afford themselves limestone sarcophagi like Yiput and Chanimit and also the priestess with the gilded silver mask. And I do believe the rest of the ladies down there in K24 are part of the class of these priests. Um, so it speaks about uh, the, the, import, the significance of the, uh, the chapel or the temple of New Chess and also the revenues coming into this temple and how rich the temple would be that is reflected in the richness of the burial of, their, their, uh, of her priests. Um, the other thing is in one statue in Brooklyn Museum, and I think it's coming from Saqqara, there is another mention for Nucius. And in this, I could read that Nucius in, on this statue is possibly been equated with Sikhmet. Um, especially here, if you see that with Chanimit, he's giving her the lioness headed serpent figure. Um, who would be a lioness in the Saqqara and Memphite proper? That would be a feline um, deity. Busted would be one of them. And definitely Sekhmet is one of them. Sekhmet has her own shrine in Abu Sir with the Sekhmet Sahore since the new kingdom in the temple of Sahore. So we know that she had a healing role within the Memphite cemetery, especially in Abu Sir. Would Nucius had a similar role, a healing role um, within the area of the, the pyramid of King Unis? Somewhere where are, I am working, where are you, you guys are working, somewhere in that area to the south of Unis, uh, would we 
ever find more clues about Neuchas, her priesthood, uh, her cult, um, a chapel in this place, her role. All what I can say right now is that all of a sudden we see Neuchas being completely promoted from an epithet of Mut into a deity, into a goddess of her own and has her own cult, but not even a serpent goddess. She is also a feline goddess that is connected with the god Ammon as well. So we were missing um, a cult, and now we see that there is a cult and a new member of the Egyptian pantheon, a new goddess, that we still need to know more about her. Amazing. Uh, I give. There are some questions uh, from... Um those who were uh, attending the lecture, so I'm, I'm going to read them for you. Yeah. Uh, Greta Sartini uh, is asking, how important was this discovery? Can we say that this is one of the very first evidence of a funerary business? Was it actually uh, advanced considering the times we are talking about? Yes, um, it is. We know about the funerary business from textual uh, references, which means papyri. Um, this is not new. And this is the good thing about uh, philology. You learn a lot about uh, from text. And then when you go to the site, um, knowing all these uh, text uh, stories and the business, and then you see things on the ground, you start to make sense. You put the archaeology and the text together. But to answer your question more direct, uh, we knew about the business of uh, the funeral business uh, from papyri, because there were contracts between uh, individuals during their lifetime and the Kawakites or the embalmers and um, arrangements for the funeral will be made by the person during his lifetime or her lifetime, or will be, there will be taken over and a uh, family member will carry out this uh, arrangement. So there is money to spend on coffins. There's money to spend on embalming. Um, and in fact, when we announce um, the results of our residue analysis of these embalming substances, we will know how important Egyptian uh, mummification industry to the world economy at the time. E Egypt mummification industry was so uh, thriving, it was so big that needed so much material from outside of Egypt. And when we announced the, the names of trees uh, from which we have these oils and the resins, you will see a completely different map of world economy at the time that served Egyptian industry, mummification industry. So you can see that there is um, always need for raw material, that is mummification substances, and you need a supplier who would provide Egyptian workshops with, with this particular uh, substances. But how many workshops we found before? This is the first one. Um, was there before? Yes, of course there was. The text says there was so many of them everywhere in Thebes, in Hawara, in Luxor, uh, in, uh, in Saqqara, in Siut, everywhere there were, it's a business, um, a class of priests that would do this mummification and arrangement for funeral for money. So we know about it from text, but this is the first time in the archeological record that we recognize these structures. Does that mean there were possibly more structures that have been not recognized by early archeologists? Possibly, yes, um, because early archaeologists in the early in the late 18, 1900 um, and the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, they were finding treasures, and I don't blame them. When you go down Padinisa, when Maspero went down Padinisa, they found this beautiful basalt sarcophagus with the inscriptions, his beautiful uh, gold amulets everywhere on the mummy of Padinisa and the calcite. This is huge. It's a treasure. So would Maspero and his 300 workmen or 400 workmen would really pay attention to all these vessels that we found and the labels on them? Maybe. But would they sit down and make the sense out of it, completely different archaeology, completely different time of Egyptology. Uh, not trash mouthing uh, anybody or criticizing anybody, but the, we are uh, in the 21st century with a completely different uh, level of Egyptology and understanding uh, Egyptian um, culture and also field method and how to do excavations. This is completely different. Um, 
does that mean we missed some of these structures in the early excavations? Possibly. So another question from Jill Akishi. Hi, Ramadam, another great lecture. Thank you. Do you have any plans to open tomb one in KV24? And talking about family relationships, will Chani meet the son of Didi Bassett? Um, I don't have plans now to open uh, tomb one because I love the uh, inscription and how it was this in little small uh, grave was covered with this thick layer of plaster and then the story has been written there. I like that to stay as it is because there's so much to be said about this family disagreement, why it has to be publicized here and why it has to be put in there. And that's one thing. It says something about there has to be a traffic going up and down this shaft and people would look at it. Possibility. So the, 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 what I'm trying to say is having this inscription in place right now and not removing it makes um, it's more useful to the understanding of the whole context. But because if I open that thing, what would I find? Not another Tutankhamun, another simple grave. Um, uh, simple mummy, and we're going to forget everything about this uh, particular text. But te the text there reminds us of the story. It needs to stay there. And this is what we're trying to do. We're not opening uh, tomb one. Um, the other part of the question was? Was whether uh, Chani Meet yes. is the son of the Bassett. Yes. Um, I can't make this jump, but it's... Uh, um, it's very tempting because uh, Chani Meet's mother is a Didi Busted and we have another Didi Busted in the complex. So um, the only way we, we have a, refer a textual reference, yes, it could be his mother. Uh, they're in the same place, uh, same complex, not in the same burial chamber, but same complex. Um, and also an important thing is that she's very prestigious lady. She, she has this very distinct burial. And also Chanimit was a priest of so many gods, by the way, not just Amun and Nuches. He was a uh, priest of, um, of Sekhmet, a priest of Isis, and a priest of Jehuti in different cities in Egypt. He's very powerful. I'm going to write about his story. Um, yes, there is a possibility that she uh, was his mother, because on his coffin and his sarcophagus, he's mentioning his mother's name as Didi Bastet, his father's name as uh, Worm Yahmes. Interesting thing, Didi Bastet, Chani Meet, Yaput, all are indication of connection to the goddess Bastet, another feline, and also indication to a connection to a Libya, Libyan community, especially the name Yaput and the name Chani Meet and the name Didi Bastet and the name Worm Yahmes. All these names, very, very connected to the Libyan community in Egypt, um, those Egyptianized Libyans. So you have a feline, busted or a sahmet, which makes me also think about new chess. Is it local? Is it an Egyptian? Is new chess an Egyptian goddess or an introduction to the Egyptian pantheon? Things to think about. I'm not, I don't have a final say, but we're still thinking. So I have for you the, the last question from uh, Gada Syed Mohammed. Uh, thank you so much for the lecture. My question is, do you think that this mummification complex uh, was used also during the Persian period? And what is the evidence you found from this period? Yes. Um, let me go down. Yes. The, I think the lifespan of this complex, it's very complicated. Middle dynasty 26, all the way to the end of dynasty 26 and possibly the Persian time. I wouldn't, there might have been an interruption and the reuse of this place in maybe dynasty 30 and early Ptolemaic period. But the interesting part about the Dynasty 26 Persian time is this very, this particular bottle right here. This one was 
It's very distinctive because it was found in the foundation deposits of King Amaziz, last king of dynasty uh, 26, and the Persians would be coming after. So it, it's, uh, it shows that, yes, this interesting pottery here, um, corpus that we have from K24 and M23 and the Wabit, it goes from the middle of dynasty 26 all the way to possibly the end of it and possibly the beginning of the Persian time. And I was, um, I was happy to show you something I didn't talk about is right here, right here. Is that the tomb that the tombs that Maspru excavated, we know Chanimit is possibly the middle of dynasty 26. Psemtik is possibly the very famous Psemtik who was the, uh, he was a chief physician and also uh, the commander of the Libyan mercenaries. And he's possibly not buried in his tomb and possibly witnessed the, um, the Persian conquest and fought against it and possibly was not a collaborator unlike Ojaha Resonet, for example, uh, because there is also, um, I was reading something for uh, Joachim Kwak about a certain Bussamtik who has been castrated as a punishment and could that be the same something from the Persian time? And the, the papyrus is um, from the Persian time. Um, could that be the same something special that we didn't have his mummy in there or burial equipment in this burial chamber? But this is one thing. The other thing is that something here is, uh, Padinisa says his father is a something, possibly this one. And Maspero says, um, since there is uh, they are on, in um, very close to one another. So Psamtik is the father of Padinisit. And that mean, that makes Padinisit here, he was the overseer of the royal palace during the time of King Amaziz. That makes him uh, witnessing the Persian uh, invasion to Egypt. But what I was always baffled by is how straight this corridor that connects all three burial chambers. And before it gets to Padinisit, it makes two right angle shifts and then goes to Padinisit. It does not cut straight like this and connects to Padinisit at all. It has to make these shifts. And I was thinking down there why he had to make these shifts before the excavation of K24, of course. When we did our excavation and had these laser scanning models, we measured the distance 30 meters deep. We measured the distance on the, on the models, this is two and a half meters. No, from here, from here, two and a half meters. Which means whoever was planning to come here was trying to avoid this in the cutting 30 meters deep. Which means K24 precedes Padimis. Which means this had been in existence from the middle of Dynasty 26 at least to the end of Dynasty 26 and the beginning of Dynasty 27. Yes, very convincing evidence indeed, yes. Well, I would like to thank you, Ramadan, for this amazing lecture. Thank you. And uh, thank you for sharing with us all the wonderful information uh, and documentation for from your amazing excavation. And uh, I must say that we are Looking forward to having you in cheering. Uh, Thank let, you. Uh, the pandemic will be over soon. And uh, no. so I hope either to see you soon in Saqqara or, uh, or here in, in cheering. So, Thanks a lot. Thanks for the invitation. Um, it was um, a great honor and a pleasure, really. No, it was our pleasure and honor. So thank you again. And I would like to say goodbye to everybody, uh, remembering that uh, the next lecture will be on the 9th of February by Dr. Antonio Morales, who will talk about early Middle Kingdom elite officials and royal strat strategies at Thebes, recent, the recent works by the University of, of Alcala Expedition, Adir al-Bahri. So thank you again and goodbye. Good bye. Evening.